Hi, I'm David Bush. Welcome back to Bush History. This topic, topic 15, is going to deal with post-Civil War industrialization. And uh, the years following the Civil War see a tremendous growth in the industrial capacity of the United States. We develop our oil industries, we develop our, our steel industry, we develop our railroad industry, mining takes off, and the United States really comes into its own and by the time we reach 1900, the United States is the industrial colossus of the world. And the question is, how does that happen? And why does that happen? There are three key names in this time period. There are certainly more than three names if we include everyone. But we'll go with John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan. They are the three kings, as I like to call them. And they're going to dominate American industry in the years following the Civil War. So I'd like to take a look right now at this PowerPoint, and then there'll be a note set as, as well. Remember, everything that I present to you is available on my website, pushhistory.net. And on the website, there's a folder with the files that I'm using here, as well as this YouTube presentation. So let's take a look and see what we have here. Here we have a flow chart of the Industrial Age, 1861, 1869 to 1901 in the United States. So let's take a look. The Civil War showed the manufacturing capabilities of the United States. There's nothing like a good war to show how manufacturing can produce things quickly. And some people made an awful lot of money during the Civil War, and that money would be applied following the war. So the Civil War leads to new wealth and entrepreneurs. If there's a way to make money, someone's going to join in on the party. Next, that leads to increases in railroad, mining, shipping, real estate, and banking, all ways that people would make money in the United States. Specifically, we're going to get Standard Oil, and that's going to be uh, John D. Rockefeller's baby. We're going to get Carnegie Steel, the Pacific Railway, and the growth of trust slash monopolies and the banking industry. Trusts and monopolies are very similar, and for the, uh, the purpose of this presentation, I'm not going to make any distinction. That's going to lead to, as I said, important names. John D. Rockefeller will dominate oil. Andrew Carnegie will dominate steel. Henry Frick will be involved in steel and the railroads. And J.P. Morgan will dominate banking. Moving along, as we develop industrially, there's going to be demand for new labor. And that demand for new labor is what's going to fuel immigration in the United States. People are going to hear all over the world, come to the United States for opportunity. There's lots of jobs in the United States. And sure enough, there will be a lot of jobs in the United States. They won't all be great, and people won't always be treated well. But nevertheless, that's the way it's going to go. Now, that demand for labor fuels immigration. Now we're going to have mechanization occurring. Mechanization of all the stuff the factories are producing is going to lead to farm overproduction. Because now, you know, Joe Farmer is going to have equipment that can produce, help him produce a lot of food on his farm. And what do farmers do? They farm. And if they can farm a lot, they'll farm a lot. So we start to have a tremendous amount of overproduction. Interestingly enough, the more farmer Joe produces, the less he's going to make. Because everyone else is doing the same thing. And when his goods go to market, there's going to be a lot of competition. And that's going to drive the price down. Consumers are going to like this, but the producers are not. And this is going to lead to an interesting quagmire within the farming business as time goes on. We're going to get debt as a result of this because farmers are not going to be able to pay back the debt, the money they had borrowed to help develop their farms. And they're going to give up their farms. And that's going to lead to a, for my, to a migration to the cities. They're going to go to cities and they're going to try to find jobs in the cities. It's not going to be the end of farming, but you're going to have the beginning of what's called agribusiness, combinations of many farms. We'll get into that. As a result of this mechanization and this overproduction, there's going to be a call for reform. Who's going to make sure that this doesn't get out of control? And we're going to get the growth of unions. There's going to be political reform. Populism and progressivism will be the terms for two of the big reform movements. There's going to be an end of laissez-faire. Laissez-faire means leave it alone. The government had established a policy of simply leaving business alone. And business will behave in the best interest of the public. Well, now we know that's not always the case. And we will get new legislation as a result. Next, all this is occurring, and by the time we hit the 1890s, we are an economic powerhouse. We are producing more than any other country in the world, and we are the Goliath. 
We're going to need new markets for this. All the stuff we're producing, we can't consume all of it. And that's going to lead to imperialism and the 20th century. That's going to get us involved in the acquisition of new territories, and it's also going to get us involved in the Spanish-American War. All right, I want to dim the lights a little bit, and let's take a look at the next slide. So here we go. Our major resources, iron, coal, and oil. Iron and coal were used for making steel. Coal to fire the foundries, and iron certainly is the raw material in making steel. Remember, steel is an alloy, so it's combined with other raw materials. Oil was mostly used for lamps at first. Oil would be used in homes to provide lighting. It wasn't used as a heating source. It wasn't used as a fuel beyond that yet. Most iron comes from eastern deposits along the Appalachian Mountains, and we still have those deposits today in the United States, and the Appalachian Mountains are still a major mining community in the United States. Uh, eventually, iron ore would be used in the making of steel, and of course, that's going to be closely connected to the railroad. They are going to need each other. And then we're going to get shipbuilding as well, and eventually skyscrapers, as we learn how to harness making steel for building purposes. Coal comes predominantly from the Appalachian region, as I said. Uh, coal production jumped from 33 million to 250 million tons in the late 19th century. Look at those numbers, 33 million to 250 million. It's about a nine-fold increase in coal production in the United States. The oil industry began with Drake's Folly, Edmund Drake in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859. It was the first intentionally drilled oil well in the United States. By 1900, John D. Rockefeller controlled 90% of the nation's oil with his Standard Oil Trust. I'll explain that in a few minutes. But imagine controlling 90% of the nation's oil. That was John D. Rockefeller. Yes, the Rockefeller of Rockefeller Center and Vice President Rockefeller under um, Gerald Ford, that family. Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan became known as robber barons. Robber barons are what the poor people call them. Captain of industry is what their friends call them. Due to, anyway, this is due to their monopolistic control over steel, oil, and banking industries in the United States. At the same time, you have this entrepreneurship of discovery going on. And people are trying to make new inventions because they can. It's almost like a renaissance in American intuitiveness and American entrepreneurship. And what do we have? We have electricity. Helped with the spread of factories. It allowed electric power to replace man-powered machinery. And it also changed the timing in factories, because now, if you could use electricity in factories, you could work those factories more. And certainly, with the advent of the light bulb, people are going to be working at night as well as daytime. Prior to the light bulb, people only worked as long as it was daylight. But once we have the light bulb, it's going to allow for people to work 24 hours a day. And certainly, that's not going to be good for the workers. In 1882, Edison built the first power plant that provided electricity to light 85 buildings in New York City. Now, those 85 buildings, became, New York City becomes the first city in the United States that's actually going to be lit. At the same time, George Westinghouse invented a different kind of current, alternating current. There's AC, alternating current, and there's DC, direct current, current. Alternating current is impulse current, DC is continuous current. Anyway, anyway, these two ideas led to the development of General Electric. The greatest impact certainly was on urban areas. The telephone. Now we're going to have the telephone so people can be able to talk to each other. What a great idea that is. And that telephone is going to call for new jobs for telephone operators. It's not like today where you pick up your phone and you punch some buttons or you dial some buttons. You picked up a phone, someone listened for the electrical connection, and they would ask you what number you wanted or who you wanted. Well, that meant that you needed jobs. You needed people to do this. And that, those became jobs for women. So now women have a different kind of job in the workforce beyond just working a machine in a factory or working a sewing machine. That led to the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. And next important event we have is a typewriter. Christopher Scholes invented the typewriter. And the typewriter is going to certainly replace you know, printing and handwriting. And we're going to get very clean ways of printing quickly on a typewriter, which ultimately would be used on a printing press. But again, more jobs, more use for skilled labor, and these jobs also dominated by women. Immigration. There's a term in American history called the old immigration and the new immigration. 
The old immigrants were immigrants who came prior to 1890. They came primarily from Northern and Western Europe, um, England, Ireland, and the like. The new immigrants came after 1890, and they came from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, the countries bordering Russia, for example, Italy as another example, the Slavic nations as another example. The fundamental difference between these two groups of immigrants is the first group of immigrants were largely English-speaking immigrants. The second group of immigrants were not English-speaking immigrants. There's a story about um, Italians arriving in Ellis Island and they couldn't speak English. So the person handling their bags, who was an Irishman by the way, the Irish built Ellis Island. Anyway, there was an Englishman uh, who was handling the bags and he goes to some Irishman and he says, so where are you going? Where are you going? And you know, where can I send your bags to? And the guy goes, oh, to New York. So they write on his bags, to, T-O-N-Y, to New York. And he says, oh, my name, my name is Tony. Yes, my name is Tony. I'm going to New York. So a lot of uh, immigrants actually had their names coming through Ellis Island because, had their names changed coming through Ellis Island because the people handling the paperwork couldn't spell the names from the Eastern European nations. Anyway. So the new immigrants numbered about 10 million, and the old immigrants numbered about 10 million. The other difference is the new immigrants came through Ellis Island, and the old immigrants did not come through Ellis Island. The old immigrants built Ellis Island for the new immigrants. And this whole idea, by the way, that Ellis Island is a welcoming center and a gateway is nonsense, because prior to Ellis Island being built, and his counterpart, Angel Island, in the, on the west coast off of San Francisco, prior to Ellis Island build, being built, immigrants could enter the United States through any port. Well, once Ellis Island was built, poor immigrants had to go through Ellis Island, they had to go through background checks, they had to go through health checks, they had to make sure they weren't criminals, and then only once they passed this complicated series of checks could they enter the United States. The wealthy people certainly didn't go through Ellis Island, they simply stayed on the ship and the ship docked in New York Harbor and they got off in New York. But the poor people had to go through Ellis Island. So Ellis Island was not a gateway, it was a gate designed to keep desirables out of the United States. So all this romance is kind of ridiculous. It's not really true in terms of Ellis Island. It was a processing center to make sure that people coming into the United States were more desirable as opposed to less desirable. As I said, the new immigrants arrived primarily through Ellis Island in New York and Angel Island off the coast of San Francisco. Now we have all kinds of labor issues occurring in the same time period. We're going to have the Knights of Labor. They're going to be the first early attempt at unionization that's successful in the United States. They were actually the largest labor union in the second half of the 19th century. It was an early attempt at national union. All working men and women belonged to the same union. So the Knights of Labor took anybody, carpenters, plumbers, seamstress, ditch diggers, it didn't matter, they took anybody. What that made for was an incredibly democratic union. At the same time, it made for a very diversified and stratified union. Very difficult to negotiate for people in a workplace with very different jobs. Nevertheless, nevertheless, their big thing was an eight hour day. They wanted an eight hour day because as, as uh, factories were able to extend their work days, they wanted to extend the work days of the, work, the workers. So they're fighting for an eight hour day. Uh, they're primarily interested in improving work conditions and ending child labor. They hit 700,000 people in 1885, which is incredible. However, they will not survive. Their strength of democracy in numbers is also going to be their downfall because they are so stratified they can't hope to meet the needs of all of their, of all of their members. They will be replaced by the American Federation of Labor. After the Haymarket riot, the uh, Knights of Labor largely dissolved because people didn't want to be involved in a union that they believed caused violence. In any case, the American Federation of Labor is going to pick up where the Knights of Labor leaves off as a major labor union in the United States. Its big difference is, and this is going to be Sam Dompers, its big difference is that they're going to accept only, only skilled workers. So what's going to happen is you're going to get locals in the American Federation of Labor. You're going to have electricians as one local. You're going to have people who work on ships as one local. You're going to have carpenters as one local. So while you have a large union, you have smaller bargaining unions. Very, very smart. They're also anti-immigrant, which is really strange because Sam Gompers was an immigrant. 
And they're also anti-black and anti-women. They're interested in wages, hours, and working conditions. They wanted more. Sam Gompers had an expression, he was interviewed once, and the interviewer said, so Mr. Gompers, exactly what do you want for your workers? And he said, very simply, more. Pretty telling, isn't it? The AFL still exists today, a very successful union. Employers used yellow dog contracts. Workers promised not to unionize as a tool against unions. So when you joined a particular job, one of the things that the employers would do is make you sign a contract that you wouldn't join a union. And of course, if you join a union, you violated that contract, and then you could be fired. Moving along, we're going to have a series of strikes. We have the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. There was a 10% cut in wages at the Baltimore and Ohio railroads. And other railroads across the United States started to join in sympathy with the Baltimore and Ohio workers. And the strike spread across the country. The strike gets so bad, it gets so bad that you start to have local troops and local law enforcement firing on the strikers. And then they find a way to bring the federal government in. The railroads say they're impeding the delivery of the mail, and that's a federal crime. So what happens? Rutherford B. Hayes sends in troops to end the strike. This was the first large-scale strike in the second part of the 19th century, and it really showed the ability of unions to organize. It also showed that the government was not behind unions. The government was behind big business in their laissez-faire mentality. Then there was the Haymarket Strike in 1886. This, this is the, uh, the famous Haymarket Strike where uh, by the time we reach the end of it, but the Knights of Labor are going to have very little power anymore. What they were working on, May 1st, 1886, there was a national demonstration for an eight-hour workday. So what happens all across the country, there are small demonstrations, in some cases very large demonstrations. One of the largest was in the Haymarket Square in Chicago. Haymarket Square, just what it sounds like. People would bring their hay to sell it in this main square in the middle of the city. A group of anarchists called a rally in Chicago's Haymarket Square. Tension was running high, and at the end, at the end of this largely peaceful demonstration, a bomb goes off. Well, the bomb killed seven police, and who was blamed? Anarchists were blamed. Anarchists were blamed, and the anarchists were caught, tried, and some were hanged. They said <coughs> it was a union conspiracy, and this union conspiracy led to an end of the, uh, of the Knights of Labor. Then we're now we have the Homestead Riot, 1892. Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Steel and, and Homestead had this perfect union, not union town, but railroad town. Everybody who worked in Homestead also worked for Carnegie Steel. So they paid rent to Carnegie. They bought stuff in Carnegie stores, and Carnegie paid them. All right, so Carnegie decides he's going to go back to Scotland, and he orders his, uh, his associate, Henry Clay Frick, to cut their wages. Well, he really fricked things up, because he did cut their wages. He cut their wages, and that's going to lead to a huge strike. On July 1st, Frick called in the Pinkertons, a private police force, to end the strike. And what they are is they're thugs. They're paid thugs, and they're going to try to break the strike by using violence against the strikers. That evening, 300 Pinkertons attempt to sneak up on the strikers. Striking workers fired on them. Many were killed on both sides. The union was forced to admit defeat, and Homestead reopened under government protection. So it was an unsuccessful strike. Again, again, the government coming down on the side of business and not workers. The Pullman strike. The Pullman strike, similar to Homestead, again, it was a company town where everybody worked for Pullman. Same general dynamics, except the Pullman workers were considered highly skilled workers. These Pullman cars were huge, lush railroad cars built for the wealthy. So these people were working on very luxurious vehicles, and their, their artisan uh, skills were highly prized. Nevertheless, George Pullman is best known for inventing the sleeping car. He was known for taking good care of his workers, providing schools and homes for them. During the Depression of 1893, Pullman was forced to cut wages. 25 to 40 percent. So you're talking about almost half of the wages were cut, and that's going to lead to this great strike. When workers protested, they were fired. A strike was called, and Pullman refused to negotiate. Eugene V. Debs was head of the American Railway Union, and he convinced 120,000 workers to join the strike. It led to a complete 
disruption of railway service in the United States, and it showed the strength that the railway union really had. President Grover Cleveland sending troops to break the strike again, like Rutherford B. Hayes, and 12 deaths occurred, and Debs was put in jail. He was put in jail for leading the strike, six months. So what general pattern can you see in the resolution to these strikes? Well, it should be pretty obvious that the unions are going to lose and the government is going to come in and help business win. So government is firmly coming down on the side of big business. Would you say that during the latter part of the 19th century, government tended to side with organized labor or big business and why? Well, we've already figured out that they're siding with big business and the why is because at this, during this time period, senators were appointed by political machines in states. And those political machines were very corrupt. And they took a lot of money from big business. So the senators were very unwilling to make any kind of legislation that would disrupt big business. The presidents were weak. We go through a series of weak presidents. It's very difficult for most people to name the presidents after Ulysses S. Grant and before William McKinley because they're basically figureheads. The Senate is in control. They're called the bosses of the Senate. And the Senate is being controlled by big business. Robert Barons and more. In 1869, we have the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. I cannot, I cannot overstate the importance of that, of that completion of that railroad. It was like putting a man on the moon because now we could travel from east coast to west coast in days. Grandma Nell could speak to Grandpa Bob via the telegraph almost instantaneously because the telegraph wires were strung alongside the railroad. No, they weren't talking. It was a series of clicks and Morse code was being used. But just imagine this. Some person in New York could speak to some person in San Francisco or send a message pretty much instantaneously. That was an incredible thing. The robber barons, businessmen like Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Morgan, they controlled so much money in the United States and had such influence on the banking industry and resource in the United States, they could pretty much move the government and move industry at will in the United States. Carnegie used an integrated means of production to control his steel business. He owned the foundries. Then he owned the railroad that brought the raw iron from the foundries, from the uh, mines to the foundries. Then he would ship the, the finished steel from the foundries to the distribution centers once again on the railroad that he controlled. So he controlled all means of production. That's an integrated approach. What that meant was he could keep his costs down, and while keeping his costs down, he could raise his prices because his cost was so much lower than the competition, the competition would simply go out of business. Not illegal, by the way. Smart, but not certainly not illegal. Rockefeller used a different approach, I'm going to show you in a second, where he controlled the marketplace. He would lower his prices to put other oil producers out of business. And that led to monopolistic tendencies, and he is going to be in trouble later on with the law, but the beginning is, once again, very smart. Give you an idea what it looks like. There are two business models. Let's take a look at the one on the, on, on the left here. Standard Oil of Ohio. What he would do, he would take his money, Standard Oil, standard, meaning he was going to standardize the oil business. John D. Rockefeller would use his money to buy out Bob's Oil, Jack Oil, Jack's Oil, Mix Oil, Tim's Oil, and Tom's Oil. But he wouldn't change the name of those oil companies. So people would think they were buying oil from the original owner. And in reality, they were actually buying it from John D. Rockefeller. And if someone resisted being bought out by Rockefeller, he would lower the price of his oil until that person could not lower their price any longer. For example, Tom, if Tom did not want to be part of Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller would say, well, it's okay. Don't be part of it. Don't be part of it. And then he would cut the price of his oil, and Tom would lower his price, and John D. Rockefeller would lower his price, and Tom would lower his price, and eventually Tom was out of business because he couldn't afford, he didn't have the cash reserves that John D. Rockefeller had. John D. Rockefeller would own controlling shares in each of the smaller companies, thereby controlling the market. This is called horizontal integration, and it's also called a trust or monopoly. Conversely, on the other side, Andrew Carnegie would work things a little differently. Starting at the bottom down here, I don't know if you can see this on the slide, but I said it's available on the presentation in the folder. He owned the iron mines. 
Then he shipped the iron on the railroad that he controlled to the foundry that he owned. Then he would ship the finished deal on the railroad he controlled to the distribution center that he owned. Shipping it again on the railroad that he controlled to the construction site, to the buildings that he was helping to build, and they were financed by his good buddy, J.P. Morgan. So what happened was, Andrew Carney, with some help from the banks and the railroads, controlled all phases of the production of steel, which meant he would keep his costs very, very low, and that was called vertical integration. So vertical integration, you control the process. Horizontal integration, you control the market. And by doing this, these two men dominated industry in the United States. A corporation, I'll show you how a corporation works. Let's pull this up. Okay. This is a mock-up of a corporate structure. John D. Rockefeller had an idea. His idea was to make oil an important resource in the United States. But he didn't have enough money at the beginning to organize all of these mines and his whole distribution system. So he decided he was going to sell part of his idea. How do you sell an idea? Well, you tell someone, I'm going to share my idea with you. And if I do well, I will share the profits with you. So dividing up an idea became known as, became known as selling shares. And what I've done here with this mock-up is create a 100-share corporation. This 100-share corporation, call this, uh, call this Bob's Oil. We'll take it away from Carnegie and Rockefeller for a second. So this guy Bob comes up with a way to sell his oil. And what does he do? He says, I'm going to sell you my oil, my part of my oil business. And it's going to be $2 a share, just for argument's sake. And how many shares would you like? And Jen says, okay, I'll buy three shares. So Jen buys three shares at $2 per. All right. And then we go to Miguel. And Miguel says, I'm going to buy five shares. So Miguel buys five shares. One, two, three, four, five. Five shares. Now Miguel owns more shares than Jen. And when the profits are made, Miguel will make more profit than Jen will. Now, we're going to go over to Ralph. Ralph wants to buy 10 shares. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Following along, Ralph now owns more pieces than Michelle, uh, than Miguel, I'm sorry, or Jen. He owns 10 shares, which means he will make more profits as the company moves along. Now, Bob is going to keep selling these shares until he sells 49 shares. Because at 49 shares, he will have gotten money from those 49 shareholders, whoever they are, but he will still control 51, which means each share has a vote, and his shares, his votes, will outvote, well, outweigh, if you like, the minority shareholders. But they don't care, because if he's good at what he does, they're going to share in the profits. And down the road, if they want to sell their shares, their shares, instead of being $2, might end up being $10. And they'll make a lot of money selling their shares to someone else. Now, if you think about this in a grand scheme, if it's your idea, you can divide your idea into a million pieces. And if you want to make a lot of money, what you do to, you know, for your idea, you're not going to make the money stick in your pocket. That would be illegal. But if you want to make this money to develop your idea, you sell 49% of those million shares. What's 49%? It's 490,000 shares to people like me or people like Jen and Miguel and Ralph. And we will invest in your idea. And you will then take our money to make your idea work. And when your idea works, our shares increase in value and we can sell them and make more money. It's really a cool idea, and it's a way you can get a lot of money very quickly. Because a bank isn't going to lend a novice a lot of money. A bank isn't going to lend you this kind of money unless they show other people are involved, unless you show other people are involved with you. A very cool idea. <coughs> so let's continue with this. 
This kind of scheming and this kind of political dealing and business dealing can get out of hand. So we're going to have legislation that comes around that tries to inhibit this as best as we can. Robert Barron believed in something called social Darwinism. Darwin, the survival of the fittest. fittest. Well, Robert Barron believed the survival of the fittest applied to business as well. If you have a better idea, you will survive, and the lesser idea will diminish and disappear. Well, they were probably true. They believed in this. They also believed that it was destined that way, that there were people who were weaker and people who were stronger, and the stronger will become rich, and the weaker will simply be the workers. Um, very unfair way of looking at life. That they said the best business ideas will, pre will prevail. Their tactics led to the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act in 1887. The Interstate Commerce Act was the first regulation to try to regulate uh, the railroads, specifically interstate going between states. And with that, what the Interstate Commerce Act did is it tried to regulate railroad rates and storage rates for grain alongside the railroads. And then it's going to be followed by the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890. Sherman Antitrust Act is going to state that combinations in restraint of trade are illegal. Okay, sounds good. That's going to go after the trust, except the courts interpret it differently. They interpret the Sherman Antitrust Act to be a combination in restraint of trade, meaning a union. So the courts actually go after the unions. Worded nicely, unfortunately, Unfortunately, the combination of restraint of trade is going to be unions, not monopolies. While this is going on, people are heading west. They're heading west for all kinds of opportunities. Moving west and closing the frontier. They go west for three reasons, basically. The railroad, the moral land grant, and the Homestead Act. The railroad brings them there. The moral land grant and the Homestead Act gave them land. The Moral Land Grant Act, 140 million acres of land was given to state governments for private sale to fund agricultural colleges. Well, we need farmers out there. So the states are going to get land to develop colleges so people can learn how to farm better and they're also going to be able to distribute some of this land to farms. The Homestead Act, 160 acres to settlers willing to live on the land and farm it for five years. So the Railroad, the Moral Land Act, and the Homestead Act are really what move people west in huge numbers. Some sad results, though, as a result of all of this, the westward movement and the growth of big business. In 1864, Colonel Shivington, notice this, by the way, the uh, Civil War is still going on because the Pacific Railway Act and Homestead Act were passed in 1862 during the war. But in either case, Civil War is still going on. In 1864, Colonel Shivington led a massacre of 450 men, women, and children in Sand Creek in Colorado. I covered this in my previous presentation. Another event occurred shortly thereafter, a little big horn in 1876. This is the famous slaughter um, of General Custer and his troops by the Indians, by the Sioux Indians, when they tried to actually ambush the Sioux Indians. 260 of his men were killed. And then we have Wounded Knee, South Dakota in 1890, a reaction again to events of the day during the ghost dance, over 200 Sioux were gunned down while performing a ritual called the ghost dance. And a lot of this is cataloged by a writer called Helen Hunt Jackson. She writes A Century of Dishonor. And she exposes how the Indians are treated throughout the 19th century and how we have taken advantage of them. This PowerPoint actually goes further, but it goes into another topic called populism, which I'm going to do as part of topic 16. I'm going to leave the PowerPoint intact on the website so you can look at the rest of the slides, but I'm really going to address the issue in the next topic. Anyway, you might notice that uh, as I'm moving along through these presentations, some things are changing in the visual aspect of things. I'm trying to find different ways to present things where the image is actually clearer. I kind of like what's going on here. We'll see how this goes. Nevertheless, this is topic 15.1. It deals with industrialization following the Civil War. It'll be on the YouTube site as Topic 15.1, Industrialization and Expansion in the Post-Civil War Era under Bush History. And you also can go to my website, www.bushhistory.net, and you're able to download these presentations and e-company materials. So for now, have a great day. Take care.